welcome and uh, hello to everyone joining us today for the Association of Moving Image Archivists online continuing education series. Today is the seventh uh, of our webinars dealing with uh, digital issues, foundational digital issues. Um, today we're joined by Eric Peel for uh, a session on looking at transferring photochemical uh, film to digital files. So um, before I move forward and introduce uh, Eric to you all, I want to ensure that folks can, in fact, hear me. Um, and we'll do a similar audio test when uh, Eric joins the line in just a moment. If you look at your control panel in front of you, there is an opportunity for you to raise your hand. There's an icon that looks like a little hand, um, and you can raise it. Or you can let us know via the chat box. Um, which is at the bottom of the control panel. So it looks like some of you have found the hand raise feature and you're letting us know. So um, thank you so much. Um, great. And this will be a good opportunity for those of you um, who are less familiar with the control panel in front of you to introduce yourself to it. So um, I want to welcome you all, as I mentioned, uh, to this session. It's the seventh of eight webinars uh, that AMIA is, uh, has put together dealing with digital issues kind of broadly. Uh, my name is Kimberly Tarr, and I'm joining you all today from New York City at New York University. I've served as the producer for many of these sessions, and it's been a pleasure getting to know many of you through the, the chat window as well. Um, you have all joined in what we're defining as listen-only mode because we have nearly 100 uh, registrants signed up for today's session. Uh, your audio has been muted, but we really do want to hear from you. Um, and we found that your comments and questions are helping us to strengthen the curriculum if EMEA does, in fact, choose to offer similar sessions in the future. If there are webinars that you have missed and are looking to uh, to listen to uh, in the future, the association's um, office will be sending out information to the listserv um, in, I think, in the next week or two about how you might be able to um, purchase those individually. Okay? So uh, before we dive in uh, to Eric's talk today, um, I do want to just point out the chat box, and that will be a fabulous way for you to send your questions to us. Um, and it looks like some of you have already located it, so great. Um, nice to see um, a lot of people that we've had before back again. So the presentation is in front of you, and uh, Eric will be moving through that as he delivers his lecture this afternoon. The materials associated with today's talk are also available for download. So there's a materials tab in the control panel. And that either looks like a little piece of paper or says the word materials. And I encourage you to download uh, both the PDF of the presentation as well as the PDF of resources that Eric Peel compiled for today's session. Um, both of those are in the materials tab. But we'll be moving through the uh, presentation with you today. So, um, by way of introduction, I want to let you know who. A little background on Eric um, before I invite him to join us. Eric Peel is a media conservator at the Kramlick Collection New Art Trust in New York. He also serves as an adjunct professor at NYU's Moving Image Archiving and Preservation Program, uh, where he teaches video preservation. Previously, Eric was the digital archivist and anthology film archive, where he oversaw the in-house digital reformatting initiatives of various audio, video, and film formats including Super 8, 16, and 35 millimeter motion picture film. <coughs> Excuse me. He's currently working on uh, developing methods for file format conformance checking through the EU-funded Reforma project as a member of, of uh, Team Media Conch for specializing on the Matryoshka FFV1 and LTEM file format. So at this point, I want to welcome Eric. Eric, are you on the line? Hey, Kim. Hello. 
Great. Hi, Eric. Welcome. And thanks again for uh, joining us for today's session. No problem. So um, I'm going to turn the uh, controls over to you at this point and give you the chance to uh, move through the presentation. Um, and so here you go. If you need anything, I'll be on the line. Great. Thank you. So um, hello and welcome again to the online continuing education series presented by the Association of Moving Image Archivists. Getting my slides going here. Um, this is the seventh webinar of the series in which we'll be discussing film digitization workflows. I'm Eric Peel, conservator of the Kremlin Collection, and uh, those interested in sending me questions following this webinar can do so at the email below. So um, before we begin, let's briefly recap Tuesday's webinar entitled Digital Film Formats. In this webinar, we discuss the activity of film scanning, which is reformatting motion picture film into high-resolution digital files and its rationale as a sustainable alternative to photochemical film preservation. We also explored the various color spaces involved in film scanning, including logarithmic and linear color encoding, and how lookup tables, or LUTs, can be used to view scan files in various display environments for quality control. We also went over several image acquisition formats, concentrating specifically on the DPX, or Digital Moving Picture Exchange file format, as it is typically seen as a de facto preservation master file for scanned film images. We also learned about several target file formats and specifications for scanning 16 millimeter and 35 millimeter motion picture film. And we presented links to sample digital film formats for attendees to download and test using basic command line tools. In this webinar, we'll be covering several workflows surrounding the activity of film scanning, including in-house digitization operations and outsourcing scanning projects to qualified vendors. In this webinar, we'll also learn about topics like film scanning, equipment recommendations, engaging in meaningful relationships with film scanning vendors, submitting requests for proposals, or RFPs, and statements of work to interested parties, and performing quality assurance and quality control functions on newly created digital assets. For this webinar, let's follow a similar structure to that of Tuesday's webinar, in which we will have a question and answer session at the end of the session. If a participant has a question throughout the talk, please write it in the chat room, perhaps with the letter Q at the beginning, so as to differentiate between those asking questions and those attempting to answer questions in the chat. At the end of this instruction, I will answer questions from the chat beginning with those submitted earliest. The beginning of every film scanning workflow, whether it be either an in-house or an outsourced project, should start with two questions. The first question is, what type of film materials do I have and which elements should I select for the digitization process? As I mentioned in webinar 6, the standards, systems, and characteristics of motion picture films vary to a great degree. For example, you can have motion picture films in various gauges, such as 8mm, Super 8mm, 16mm, 35mm, and so forth. You can have films in various polarities, such as positive or negative. 
and you can have film elements used in various points of the production process such as a camera original film element or a release print for exhibition. Film elements may also contain audio with different types of soundtrack configurations. This identification and selection process is not unlike that of preserving a film photochemically. A great resource for identifying film elements in this manner that I've provided in this slide and I've also included here in the resources PDF attached to the webinar is Paul Reed and Mark Paul Meyer's Restoration of Motion Picture Film. This book includes a comprehensive glossary on film identification and selection. The second question is, what is the end result to scanning a particular film element? Are you scanning a film element for the purposes of creating the highest quality digital facsimile for archiving? Are you scanning a film element for the purposes of creating access through either digital cinema distribution or through viewing on a, comp on a contemporary electronic display monitor? Are you scanning a film element for web-based viewing purposes? Are you scanning a film for digital restoration or digital intermediate work? Or are you scanning a film element for all of the above? This question of a target goal or end result should be realized before beginning a project such as this. Let's take a quick example of a very common film element found in many archives, a 16 millimeter positive print with an optical monaural soundtrack. For teaching purposes, let's construct several tiers of file formats. These tiers would more or less consist of a preservation master tier or file formats used for the purposes of creating the highest quality digital facsimile for archiving. A mid-level tier or mezzanine tier for production or potential archiving use. And an access tier. In this particular example, a preservation master tier for scanning 16 millimeter film would consist of a DPX sequence rendered in either a 10-bit logarithmic or 12-bit linear encoding with a resolution of 2K and with audio captured as a separate broadcast wave file with a bit depth of 24 and frequency of 96 kilohertz. For tier 2, the mezzanine tier, one could make a 10-bit uncompressed QuickTime wrapped file in a color space designed for high definition display environments. This file would consist of a resolution of 1920 by 1080 pixels with PCM audio in a 24-bit 48 kilohertz standard. Note that in this instance, the V210 uncompressed video and PCM audio streams would be wrapped within the QuickTime media container itself, making a single file. This is known as interleave. For an access tier, one could make a QuickTime wrapped H264 file in a color space designed for high definition display environments. This file would also consist of a resolution of 1920 by 1080 with AAC encoded audio in a 24-bit 48 kilohertz standard. Like the previously described mezzanine file, the H.264 and AAC audio streams would be wrapped within the QuickTime media container, making a single file. Another example is the 35 millimeter positive print. In this example, the specifications are more or less the same, with the difference being the resolution of 4K within the DPX image sequence. B-1000 
Beyond file format specifications, there are several workflows that an archivist can employ for film digitization. For example, an archivist can utilize an image-only scan for silent film elements. For composite elements, meaning image plus a track, audio can be transferred or picked up and synchronized. Other elements, like track negatives, can be digitized and later synced to associated picture elements. And in a more esoteric workflow, film can be scanned and optical sound included within the scanned picture area. This is otherwise known as extra frame scanning or edge to edge. Where a tool like the University of South Carolina's Moving Image Research Collections, AEO Light, can be used to extract sound information. Archivists must carefully consider these workflows when crafting a digitization project. Many of you engaged in this webinar are probably interested in developing your own in-house motion picture film scanning workflows. So let's run through some considerations, including equipment and staff. A brief list of equipment consider considerations include film scanners, film cleaners, display devices for monitoring, IT infrastructure and image processing or rendering, and other ancillary film scanning or digitization items. Film scanners can be broken more or less into at least two tiers. The first tier consists of machines that offer scanning at 2K near or around real time using one CCD or charge couple device. And the CCD is where the voltage um, gets converted to digital values. It's, it's a little complex for this webinar, so I won't go into it. Second tier film scanners offer up to 4K scanning in real time and employ three CCD chips for each of the RGB channels. Tier 1 film scanners are considerably more expensive based on these features. Other specifications for film scanners factor into cost, such as does a scanner employ particle transfer rollers, or PTRs, for removing debris? Does the film scanner's path use a sprocketless, sprocketless path for shrunken or stretched film? Or does it use a pin register system? Does it allow for more than one format or gauge? Can sound be transferred? Is wet gate scanning an option? When choosing a film scanner, consider the film elements involved. If your collection consists primarily of black and white multi-generational prints, for example, a tier, one, a tier two scanner might be the preferred choice here. Here's a brief list of available film scanners today. Note that this list is neither exhaustive nor an endorsement for any specific machine. This list simply shows some of the potential options for institutions interested in purchasing a film scanner. Cleaning film prior to film scanning can, ha can save huge amounts of time in post-production, digitally removing debris and other objects. The majority of archives would be interested in isopropyl alcohol film cleaning solutions. Perchloroethylene, or PERC, on the other hand, does a great job with concealing baseline scratches, as it contains the same refractive index as film itself. However, these systems require an operating license. Film scanners, while they uh, scan at 2 or 4K, 
usually provide real-time HD SDI video outputs for monitoring. So when purchasing a film scanner, you also need to invest in a good HD Rec. 709 color space monitor. Several HD monitors have onboard waveform monitors and vector scopes for quality control purposes. And I've offered a few vendors here, um, such as Flanders, ESO, Sony, and Panasonic. Of course, you'd also need audio monitors for um, monitoring any kind of audio uh, when scanning tracks. And uh, a few vendors for this are uh, Genelec, the Genelec brand, and M Audio. When developing your system for scanning film, it's important to develop a strong IT network to push digital assets around. Chances are you're going to have a film scanning station and a separate station for editing or color correction. Several options for an IT pipeline are available, such as having a gigabit ethernet pipe, which is usually associated with networked attached storage, or a fiber channel pipe. I've personally used the more cost-effective gigabit Ethernet pipeline in past film scanning workflows without too much issue. Fiber channel SANs, on the other hand, are significantly faster and more expensive. Of course, there are some ancillary items that you'll need to purchase as well. I recommend purchasing um, power conditioners for each uh, component in the film scanning chain, as well as any related station for color correction or editing and so forth. For post-production activities, components like color correction panels are essential, as well as waveform monitors for monitoring the signals. There's also software to consider. There's sc scanner specific software, such as Edeltech's Agiscan suite designed for use in the MWA Nova line of scanners. Blackmagic DaVinci Resolve works as a scanning software for the Sintel line of film scanners, but can also be used for color correction and editing as third party software. For nonlinear editing, institutions can employ such software as Apple's Final Cut Pro, Adobe Premiere, or Avid. For digital restoration, there's off-the-shelf solutions like Pixel Farms, PF Clean, or MTI Suite of Restoration tools. Finally, when institutions need to make derivative files, some possible software options include Adobe Media Encoder, Apple's Compressor, or the open source tool, FFmpeg. Keep in mind that this isn't a complete list of available software by any means. It doesn't include metadata extraction software such as Media Info, viewing applications like Image Magic or Graphics Magic, or file packaging tools such as Bagot. In addition to film scanning equipment and digital infrastructure, institutions interested in setting up an in-house film scanning workflow also have to consider staff resources. A typical production line includes a film archivist who prepares film, for example, repairing splices, adding leader, and so forth, prior to digitization. Next, you have a film scanning technician who is the operator of the film scanner itself, a full-time job for any institution with the expectation of a high film scanning throughput. Next, there's a colorist who may apply digital color grading to scan films in order to match a specific film element or to tailor color to a specific viewing environment. 
for scanned film assets that need to be combined or synchronized. An editor is also needed. And what of films that need are in need of major digital restoration? All of these jobs require precision, experience, and time. For those still interested in setting up in-house film scanning workflows, I encourage you to go forth and seek out the resources described above. You will find it a very satisfying and fulfilling endeavor. However, every institution at one point or another with motion picture film will find themselves in need of procuring a vendor to perform some digital related activity. In the following slides, we'll be discussing the activity of outsourcing film scanning projects, which will include finding qualified vendors, submitting requests for proposals and statements of work, as well as preparing and delivering film and other components. At this point, I would like to mention several invaluable resources online that are related to this topic. The first one is the Federal Agency's Digitization Guidelines Initiative, or FADKES, Digitizing Motion Picture Film, Exploration of the Issues and Sample Statement of Work, which is currently a draft and was submitted for public comment in September. The next resource is Digitizing Video for Long-Term Preservation, an RFP guide and template created by the Barbara Goldsmith Preservation and Conservation Department at New York University Libraries. While this request for proposal template concentrates solely on video, its template and structure are completely applicable to the outsourced scanned film projects we'll be talking about. Finally, AV Preserve has created a guideline to developing a request for a proposal for the digitization of video, which was published in 2013. Links to all of these resources will be available in the associated resources PDF found with this webinar. To clarify the differences between requests for proposals and statements of work, an RFP is dis distributed to a selection of vendors. Interested vendors will then submit a proposal to the institution for review. When a vendor is selected for the project, a final statement of work is drafted, serving as the contract between the vendor and the institution. I'm just going to tell these people to stop making so much noise. Thanks everyone for holding tight here while we uh, attempt to decrease the background noise. Um, I see that we have a few questions that have also come up as we've been moving forward, so we'll be sure to tackle those um, uh, and Eric return to the line. and. Um, undoubtedly, keep you know keep your questions coming in as they arise, and we'll tackle them. Eric, hey, are you back with that. us? Yeah, sorry no about problem. that. Okay. So, okay. Okay. So there are several ways in which you can find a good film scanning vendor. The Association of Moving Image Archivists, who sponsor this webinar series, have a frequently updated supplier directory containing a reformatting and restoration services section, which features around 90 vendors worldwide. While the July 2015 EMEA supplier directory is available online through the provided link, an October 2015 update will be published this month. 
Another way to find qualified vendors is through EMEA L, EMEA's email listserv. Subscription information may be found in the associated link on this slide. Note that these links will be placed in the attached PDF to this webinar. Before we move on from that slide, Eric, I just wanted to, to mention to folks because at NYU we've, we've done uh, a bit of work in um, assisting organizations and institutions in thinking about working with vendors and, and many people reach out to us with questions regarding how to locate vendors and I think that um, the two resources that uh, Eric highlights here, the EMEA supplier directory as well as the EMEA listserv, which um, is quite possibly the way that many of you found out about these webinars. Those are a really great um, starting point for identifying potential vendors. And then undoubtedly, we really, um, we really recommend talking to colleagues and talking to folks in the field who have actually um, have firsthand experience working with these vendors. Um, and then you know, asking if, if you don't know people who have used them, asking them uh, the vendors for references and checking in. Um, it's a great starting point. I just wanted to highlight that, Eric, before you move forward. Sorry to interject. No, great. No, thank you very much. It also gave me enough time for these people making noise to leave, so it was great. Um, okay, should we advance a few slides here? Great. So, um, Typically, a request for proposal is going to include um, the following items. Um, usually, it includes a project description and a timeline, um, usually about uh, maybe four or five sentences. Um, the bulk of it would be an object description, so um, this is where you get very technical with the information related to the films themselves. This includes um, format or cage, polarity, it's positive or negative, um, any kind of associated footage. Um, what the file format deliverables, deliverables will be, whether you want a, uh, like we were talking about, a DPX or uh, a DPX and audio or a uh, more mezzanine style um, QuickTime or MXF. Um, and these would be laid out in the RFP as well as uh, facilities guidelines. When, you're, when a film goes to a vendor, how are they handling it once it's uh, received? Um, is it in an environment that is safe? Um, is it smoke free? Hopefully it is in 2015. Um, also workflow and transfer specifications. Um, what are you looking for in a vendor's workflow specifically? Can it scan edge? Can a vendor scan edge to edge if you decide to? Um, also, what are the um, parameters behind quality assurance and quality control? Meaning, um, what kind of equipment are they using? Um, when you get files back as deliverables, what kind of display environments um, do you need to view them on in order to approve them? Um, to make sure that you guys are looking at more or less the same image in the same uh, display environment. Also, any kind of associated uh, descriptive or technical metadata that you want captured um, or embedded within the file itself, and I have an example of that later. Also, vendors um, will typically provide uh, references uh, related to past clients or projects, as well as uh, case studies. Um, say there's there's a project that was done in the past that's similar to your own um, RFP. Um, if they're allowed to talk on it, then they would be able to uh, provide some kind of guideline. And also um, sample uh, transfers. Um, if you had a particular file that was crafted somewhere else that you could provide to a vendor to give them an understanding of how you want things done. I also thought it would be handy to kind of have a quick slide about vendor line items. So vendors may break down line items on invoices in specific ways with prices associated with specific units. 
For example, a line item might include scanning a 16 millimeter silent color reversal print, which would include adding any necessary additional leader for the scan itself, running the films through a film cleaner if so desired, and transferring the scan and film assets to a client's hard drive. This line item is usually charged by the foot of film, for example, 40 cents per foot. Other items, such as digitizing an associated soundtrack, also known as an audio pickup, and synchronization with an associated film element may be charged by the minute. The shipping of films and digital deliverables, on the other hand, is usually charged on a per unit basis. So in thinking about um, you know, crafting an RFP, it's also um, worthwhile in um, developing uh, parameters for um, shipping inventories and then um, creating receipts of delivery. When, uh, when a vendor receives an item from you, it's important that they um, create a receipt for that item so that it's not lost um, in, you know, in time. Uh, there's also, on both the vendor and uh, client side, a packing of film materials and hard drives. Um, I know that some vendors have very specialized care packing of materials, and um, some clients will, um, you know, ship hard drives in certain manners. Um, but this is, these are all things that are worth discussing in, a, in an RFP. Um, also, if you have any kind of sidecar metadata schema like METs or MODs or something like that, it's kind of worthwhile to uh, show that to a vendor um, in, or in order to let them know that, that, that you know that they understand the schema that, that you want laid out in a film digitization project. Um, but also this kind of factors into cost as well. So um, completed work can be delivered to institutions in several ways. Um, a common way is to use external hard drives um, with either one or two terabyte storage capacities and connectivity such as Thunderbolt or USB 3.0. Um, the Lacey Rugged series of external drives, for example, comes to mind for this kind of use. Um, keep in mind that the scan assets would be stored temporarily to these devices and effectively shuttle from the vendor to the client. For larger projects, portable RAID hard drive arrays can be used, which contain a large amount of available storage space and may be stripped for extra redundancy. Um, one thing I should quickly mention here is that hard disks are submitted, that are submitted to vendors should always be formatted with an agreed upon file system. This will prevent any miscommunication down the line when hard drives are sent back to clients containing uh, file deliverables that cannot be accessed due to uh, improper formatting. Data tape such as LTO tape can also be submitted as a deliverable. Like hard drive disks, agreeing upon a generation of LTO tape as well as the type of formatting prior to delivery is crucial. LTO tape may be formatted in several ways. The most common in the current generation of LTO tape, which is the sixth generation, is LTFS. LTS sixth generation tape allows for a maximum storage size of 2.5 terabytes, which works well for preservation master uh, file deliverables such as DPX and broadcast wave audio files. FTP or file transfer protocol servers can be set up in which a client can download deliverables from a web from the web across a secure network. While this service might be cumbersome for preservation master tier file deliverables, it's excellent for receiving mezzanine or access copies as well as proxy files for review. Cloud delivery services, like FTP services, are 
excellent for receiving mezzanine or access copies. However, the service might be too clunky and unmanageable for larger file deliverables. So um, let's quickly go over the statement of work. And this is something that after an RFP has uh, been submitted to a vendor and you're engaged in uh, this project with them, this is the basically the final cont uh, contract, which um, is very detail-oriented. Now, statements of work uh, typically contain the following components, which are a brief overview of the institution's mission, and how this relates to the film elements that are being scanned. It also includes a description of the film elements or the source material. And then also the objectives of the project uh, with including uh, the digital deliverables and the specifications for the target file formats. It includes a basic timeline with uh, milestones for throughput. It also includes any method of uh, payment on behalf of the uh, client, as well as shipping and logistics, and then any points of contact between the vendor and client. So, um, an institution should also supply the necessary metadata fields and schemas to the vendor. Kinds of metadata include descriptive, technical, and provenance information. Institutions may also want vendors to encourage the act of embedding metadata within the files themselves, making them more self-descriptive. Here's an example of motion picture film information within a DPX industry specific header, including such important provenance information such as the film manufacturing ID code, film type, the particular frame position from within the, a DPX image stack, and the film's original frame rate. And again, um, it's important in having this, in, in crafting a statement of work, having these under, this understanding of quality assurance and quality control, in which quality assurance um, will describe the vendor's um, environment of, of capturing the film. And then also setting up uh, instances in which you can be able to uh, view a deliverable and approve it um, on site at your institution um, and be able to confirm that you are seeing more or less the same thing that the uh, vendor is seeing on their side. Quality control also includes uh, visual assessment and then um, aspects related to digital preservation such as uh, bit level fixity. So in the event that an institution requests a top tier preservation master file format like DPX to be made, uh, typically a derivative or a proxy copy will be made and submitted for quality control and approval. Here a proxy copy is typically a tier two or a mezzanine format, such as JPEG 2000 wrapped MXF, FFV1 wrapped Matroska, or QuickTime Apple ProRes file which can be played successfully on a client-side computer and display environment. There's actually a precedent to this type of quality control workflow in that it is similar to receiving uh, an answer print for approval in a typical photochemical uh, film preservation workflow. So we just briefly um, discussed um, quality control by way of digital preservation. And um, I just want to mention that the open source software tool Bagot is a very good solution for managing the fixity of uh, very large DPX image stacks. 
So uh, in the provide example, you'll see a bagged DPX sequence um, with the with the image stack nestled in the bags payload, which is the um, associated data folder. In the MD5 manifest text file of the bag, you'll see each DPX file with the given image stack along with a corresponding MD5 hash value for fixity checking. So I just want to go over between these two um, two webinars, just kind of some basic takeaways. Um, I think a big one is a lot of it is about knowing what fill element elements you have, and then also what um, target outputs you want to produce. I, I can't really stress that enough. Um, you know, knowing more about your film elements will really um, create a better situation when you either um, proceed to scan films in-house or send them out to a vendor, um, as well as having, you know, a goal in mind when it comes to digital outputs um, and, and knowing what you're getting in terms of what, what am I really getting when, I'm, when, I'm, when I want a DPX file, how can I use it, how can I um, make derivatives from it. And this is typically done by uh, knowing file format specifications. So um, if you if you are considering adopting you know, a, f a file format for an institution, you should really read up on its specifications if they're uh, available. Um, what kind of uh, standards organization is uh, standardizing that file format? Um, and these, all these things are going to be able to help you um, kind of decide whether this file format is good for your institution or not. Um, another point is that, you know, in-house film scanning can be worthwhile, but it, it does require a lot of time, resources, and staff. And I, I think it's worth the people of this webinar to really reach out to other institutions who are doing this kind of in-house film scanning um, to, to see if it more or less lines up with, with your institution uh, in terms of resources and staff. Um, there are a lot of institutions now that are doing in-house film scanning, so it's, it's important that you kind of develop this network in which you guys can talk about troubleshooting issues or um, different kinds of case studies that you're coming across. And also, last but not least, is um, understanding digital preservation needs when considering film scanning. So, um, you know, if you're creating a, a massive DPX file, what does that mean in terms of digital preservation? Um, does your in, can your institution um, af afford to be able to carry that massive file through time and be able to um, give it proper care in terms of digital preservation. So at, the, at this point I'm just going to hold on the slide and then uh, we can kind of open it up to questions. Great, thank you so much Eric. Um, we have a number of great questions that have been uh, popping up um, over the course of the session. So what I'd like to do is kind of take it from the top. And first of all, uh, Kevin Powell had reached out with a question regarding a price range for scanners. Um, I know some folks uh, in, in the chat box had responded. Do you have a kind of a range of uh, price that you think people should kind of consider for the scanner alone? And of course, there are ancillary, there are other pieces of equipment necessary as well. But do you have a, a price range that you'd be comfortable sharing? so so yeah the um, so like I talked about there are like these tier one scanners that um, will scan at two to four K in more or less real time and they have three CCDs um, you're getting 
a lot better color information. Um, these machines are typically going to be um, in the ballpark of around um, you know, $300,000 or $400,000 and, and up. Um, Three hundred thousand dollars is kind of like the, the um, the ground floor there. Um, so th this is not to say that this isn't counting for all the other um, components that you have to purchase. This is just a scanner right. itself. Um, so that being said, the kind of tier two is the specifications kind of consist of doing possibly 2K in real time, um, doing 4K in, rest, in less than real time. You typically have one CCD, so you're not essentially getting the uh, same amount of like, color information as you would say scanning on a three CCD system. Um, and those are, those are going to fall below, you know, anywhere from 250,000 to um, like I would say 40,000. Okay. That's for the, the tier two kind of level scanner that you described. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. I think, I think someone else had, had responded with a, a general range of around 165 to upwards of three plus. So, um, so I think it really depends on, as you've been defining, what individuals are looking for in terms of um, the technology for, for their scanner. Um, uh, I think there was another question Wendy had posed earlier on in terms of um, embedding metadata. What software is available for embedding metadata uh, um, in the creative? So um, for DPX files, there's a software program called DPX Header Editor, I believe. Um, and then there's also on the command line um, graphics magic, which has a suite that's kind of like specifically designed for uh, DPX. So the, those those two are, are more or less like really good tools for embedding uh, metadata in, in DPX sequences. Okay, yeah, and her question um, was specifically looking, at, you know, especially when using editing software that doesn't support this, like, you know, Final Cut Pro um, X or 10, um, the question was about embedding metadata. So, um, and then I, I, I think that um, Reto had responded as well with um, Natron, or, or Natron, Natron, an open source editing suite, um, which is also an option. Are you familiar with that, Eric? I'm not, but I'm going to check it out as soon as I'm done with this. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> great, great. Um, okay, so moving on in terms of considering options for uh, cleaning film uh, prior to transfer, there's a question related to um, uh, isopropyl alcohol and uh, what you recommend in terms of, uh, I guess, percentage. I'm, I'm sorry, uh, can you broke up there. Can you repeat that question? Sure, in terms of thinking of film cleaning, uh, and you had mentioned uh, isopropyl alcohol, the question was, what percentage blend would you recommend for cleaning film? Um, there's a specification. So when I was cleaning film, um, I was using a specific um, uh, Linsner Smith film cleaner, and it called for a specific um, percentage of isopropyl alcohol. Um, let me let me find out and get back to you. I just don't have it in front of me. Okay. Um, okay, I think that, let's see, um, we had a couple other questions. Um, in terms of, uh, let me just go back up. Uh, we had a question from Demetrius um, out in California, Internet Archive. Um, in really considering the, the um, scanning for access, and um, for 8, Super 8, and 16, and what should be paying attention to in terms of throughput? How does scanning for access, sorry, um, and you know, with a considerable number, high volume of films, what should be paying attention to in terms of throughput? the question. 
So, um, so I, th I, th I think that's a good question, um, especially with in-house film scanning. Um, I think I typically take um, a number in which whatever the duration of the film element, whatever that duration is, um, assuming that you're going to be scanning in like real time, I'll probably multiply that from anywhere from three to five times and that will kind of give me a sense of um, how much time it's going to take to uh, to, sk to scan that work um, to, uh, to to write to like a high resolution file um, and then perform any kind of like uh, cre creation of derivatives. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I think so. We'll see if, if there are follow-up questions uh, that emerge as well. I, I should also note that um, uh, we usually use 99% isopropyl alcohol here at NYU. I know there was some uh, discussion as well in terms of uh, chemical composition and what uh, I, percentage of water. So 99% is usually... Um, well, I'm 99% yeah. sure that it's 99%. I just want to look at the <laughs> Bill Smith uh, spec sheet to make sure that I'm not um, uh, incorrect. Gotcha. Um, I'm curious. It seems like um, some people um, are interested. It would be great to hear from you if you are have already embarked on an in-house uh, scanning uh, process and workflow. There seem to be some questions out there as well. Um, and one in particular is looking at quality control workflows. So if you have an in-house uh, scanning and digitization operation, do you have any recommendations on uh, processes for quality control? So, um, so like I said, uh, when you, you, even when you scan things in-house or you, you get files back, when, you, um, when you're dealing with high uh, definition like DPX, like image acquisition files, you're really looking at the um, derivative proxies to get a sense of how, um, how, th how things are, are being scanned. So um, I'm sorry if I wasn't really clear on that, but um, when you scan, for most of the times when you're scanning film, you're getting a basically a high definition video feed um, that you are using as a as a film scanning technician to be able to make um, value judgments about um, how, how about um, correcting any kind of um, errors with uh, light or, or making making adjustments uh, to make sure that things aren't uh, necessarily clipping um, the or the whites aren't overexposed or the blacks aren't in the mud. Um, you're you're mostly doing this all on um, kind of a, a high definition video um, display device. So um, I, you know I think the onus is on any institution doing this kind of work or, or um, outsourcing it is to like invest in good um, display device technology, um, and then also talking to your vendors that you're getting. Uh, scan fill from being kind of kind of like what are you using to, to view this? Um, are we in the same uh, color space? Um, how, how should I be viewing this um, in my environment? Um, so it's really about having this like one-to-one -one, uh, relationship with either a client or a vendor or um, or for in-house purposes being able to have proper color management throughout an entire system. So, you know, I was talking about um, on Tuesday that, like, you know, um, we, we're using these lookup tables to kind of make um, grading value judgments when, when we're scanning film. We're not really looking at um, a log color space when it's coming off of the scanner. We're looking at a high definition rendering of that, and then we're applying. Uh, the same principles of, of levels of of, um, of, of mid-ranges and, and different kinds of levels um, 
which will be applied um, down the line. Okay, moving on to um, our next question here. It looks like there was a question regarding um, JPEG 2000, um, MXF wraps JPEG 2000, and recommendations for software players. Um, I believe that Adobe Premiere will play MXF wrap J2Ks, and then also uh, Avid systems are able to do that. Okay. Um, so this is a question I think that's probably on a lot of people's uh, minds. So if you work with a vendor to move forward and create, a, you know, do a 2K scan of your 16 millimeter film, and you get a DPX files, you get these um, this, these huge files. In terms of access in house, um, someone has a question um, about how difficult it would be to create access derivatives in house, and I think that's probably fairly dependent upon your in house um, you know resources and capabilities, both processing. Um, but I'm going to let you tackle that question. So if a vendor creates a tier one or tier two preservation file, how difficult would it be for access derivatives? to be created in-house? So um, I would say first off that um, if you're working with a vendor that it's, you know, it's important you're creating these DPX style files is that you should always have a proxy made that more or less matches um, the display environment that you have in your institution. Um, so that way you at least have a reference to what um, the vendor is is um, is providing um, if you if you can't access that DPX file um, in in a way that that is manageable in terms of color spaces, which I think it's not it's not very manageable for most institutions. So the safer bet is to have a proxy file made um, in conjunction with um, scanning these like higher resolution to these higher resolution files. Um, that being said, I feel like it is definitely manageable to make um, derivatives from from DPX like uh, files um, in house. Um, granted, you have a dedicated computer that um, has enough processing power to um, mm -hmm. be able to handle um, transcoding from. DPX to you know a, a, a mezzanine or an access copy, um, but I don't, yeah I think it's certainly manageable, um, and there are kind of um, off the shelf uh, software applications like DaVinci Resolve that really are able to um, make that workflow really kind of streamlined. Okay, great. That's really helpful, but. It seems like one of the key considerations is that if you are working with a vendor to create DPX kind of preservation level files, then it's really in your interest to also, at that point in time, have uh, proxy access copies made uh, for your archive as well. Um, okay, so um, let's see here. We had a question about. Um, uh, Software can uh, no, we we pretty much well. You kind of can't uh, covered that just now. There was another question about software for converting tier one, so the DPX files to a tier two, like a MOV, uh, a QuickTime file, like a 10-bit uncompressed, or even a tier three. So we were just talking about that um, a little bit. Any other software considerations that you'd like to include? Um, I, I feel like I feel like DaVinci Resolve is a really good tool for doing this. Um, I feel that FFmpeg could do it, um, but I feel like for most um, uh, webinar attendees that like getting into DaVinci Resolve for this kind of workflow in the same way that you would get into a nonlinear editor would, is, is, is a good step forward in understanding the process and understanding like how the lookup tables are applied and, and things like that. Okay. Um, a file naming question. Do you have recommendations for uh, file names for DPX files, file name elements? 
um, um, you know, for folder file structure? I should say that, um, <clears throat> sorry, um, that it's really kind of up to your institution, but um, there is a, um, I believe, a six digit um, uh, a extension, you know, before the, the for the file format um, that allows for the sequencing of the DPX image stack, um, kind of like that example that I showed you, um, where you know the the, um, the first frame began at zero 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 one, and then and then so so on and so forth. Um, I think it's probably worthwhile to append um, like kind of institutional specific file naming conventions before that um, just for ease of moving through um, lots of DPX sequences so that they don't normally all start with with this um, you know w w with the six digit uh, number series. Okay, um, moving through our chat questions, um, question from Ian uh, Matson. given there is a great deal of audiovisual material to catalog for greater access, I'm curious to hear your thoughts about how this can be done quickly and cheaply. Wow, question of the day, <laughs> that's a big one. <laughs> um, well, I feel like this is where you have a big advantage to um, employing like in-house scanning where you can really get um, members of the archive involved to a greater extent so um, if you're um, you know if you're digitizing if you're scanning film like you have an archivist there that's able to capture um, you know descriptive information about the film um, in such a way where a, a vendor could probably not have time or the resources to do such a thing. Um, I feel like that's one of the real big benefits of doing in-house film scanning where you can really incorporate um, you know, d different staff members that would really contribute um, to not only cataloging but um, you know, uh, in some to, in, to some extent, like curating and and and, and things like that. Um, I imagine that this is something that also is like there is somebody here from the Internet Archive. I imagine that's kind of like a similar process, um, and ho hopefully they find the similar kind of um, satisfaction in having um, having in-house film scanning workflow that involves you know. Uh, cataloging staff, film technicians, so forth. Great. Um, next question is in regard to um, the FASD document that you mentioned in your presentation that is um, was just released last month. Um, the question is, I'm wondering how you handle A and B roles. Um, the document, the FASD document, touches on this um, uh, just briefly. The fades and dissolves could be recreated quite easily. But in terms of recording all the relevant information alongside your DPX files, do you recreate the flow sheet in spreadsheet form and store that alongside your DPX files? Um, also, there's a lot of redundant black frames to store. So wondering if you choose a lower resolution um, for those sections of each reel, or do people choose to omit scanning the black frames entirely and rely on metadata and file naming to show the editing structure of the film? Do you have any thoughts on that, Eric? Or A and B. Well, I think it's definitely an interesting case study that I think should be um, expanded upon. That I think the Faggy document references kind of briefly um, in that, like, what is the what is an acceptable archival copy of uh, an A or or B roll? Um, and you know, like you said, like there are all these. Um, Kind of resources and things taking up space, like black frames, that might not necessarily be the best, uh, you know, solution. Like, is the if it is a composite of an A and B role, um, 
something that is more manageable in the long term. Um, I mean, I, I, I definitely would be interested in that. Um, but there is, I mean, there obviously is a workflow in place with vendors um, who, to to which they scan A and B roles, and then would most likely, um, you know, perform editorial um, and apply like the necessary transitions. Um, but yeah, those are kind of interesting questions. Like, if you're scanning in an A role as a DPX, like, is it necessary to keep all of the, um, you know, the the black frames that really contain uh, no information? Um, right. I think it kind of really depends on the, you know, the principles of the institution and um, and and, th and things like that. And also perhaps the work itself. Right. Um, one question, uh, another question that, that um, uh, came up here is if if an institution is scanning, um, uh, for example, receiving having their film scanned at 2K and then receiving the 10 pit uncompressed, um, for example, QuickTime wrap file, is that sufficient? If they're not getting the DPX files, if they're only you know the deliverable that the vendor is providing them with, which I assume is what they asked for, if that is um, sufficient for preservation, or at this point in time, um, should we be encouraging people to consider holding the DPX as well? Um, I, I mean, I feel like it's all relative to what your, you know, kind of end game is. Um, you know, with these mezzanine files, you are really locking yourself in in terms of being able to uh, have that asset be accessible in only a handful of um, you know uh, video color spaces as opposed to um, a DPX where you can you know push out to um, kind of contemporary display and you know display environments and also like things like digital cinema um, so my my intuition is to keep the DPX file, um, you know, as long as you can, and then make derivatives when you can. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's it's kind of a tricky thing. Um, you know, not not everyone can preserve every film that they own uh, as a DPX sequence, like we were talking about on Tuesdays. Um, right. There's I mean, there's there's obviously getting very technical with it, and that like does um, ten bits of quantization more or less amount to the information contained on the film, and that really kind of depends on a case by case basis. Um, but yeah, these are these are all kind of interesting avenues to like investigate, and I feel like this area of archiving is still kind of evolving and um, it's, it's still being written. Like obviously this RFP is, is fresh off of the presses. Um, it's a draft. It's, it's definitely going to get revised. So it's the, the people are trying to figure out these workflows in a meaningful way and then mm -hmm. um, and, and you know uh, there, there's more than one answer to these questions. Right. Definitely. Um, I, I'm wondering about uh, scope and anamorphic form, uh, films. Ben Moskowitz poses a question. <clears throat> Would you stretch it during or post scanning? For scope oh, well, that's, or a, anamorphic film? that's a frightening question because I've never, I, to my knowledge, <laughs> I've never, well, I've, you, when you scan films, I mean, it, what you see on the bench is going to be what you get. Um, so it's going to have to happen in post. Um, I hope that's the simple answer to that. Yeah, so if, 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 if um, folks out there who are involved in scanning have, um, in fact, uh, work, worked um, on this uh, workflow, let us know. We'd be eager to hear um, any additional thoughts. Um, a question from Hannah Palin in terms of uh, what are power conditioners? Can you say a little bit more about that? Um, power conditioners, basically, um, they stabilize. Um, any kind of like uh, uh, 
you know, outlets you may be using in, in, the, in a given um, station area and that if you get some kind of like um, voltage like disruption or something like that, it's, um, it's not going to necessarily interfere with your system too much. And then also, um, you know, if you, if something goes offline um, or if there's a power outage, there's also um, conditioners with backup units that will be able to like properly power down um, things like uh, computers um, that are that are attached to like you know film scanners and things like that, um, because you are dealing with like a lot of um, electric components and um, you, you want to be able to like protect them from anything uh, outside that could that could really um, you know b destroy circuitry in in that way. Great. Um, is there an available reference for computer specifications recommended for dealing with the digital audiovisual files? Um, oh, sorry, um, such as memory processing, um, such as memory or processing speed. Um, I have to, I have to think about that one. I haven't really seen one. Um, I mean, there there was a great paper that Dave Rice put out. Um, for the Tate a few months ago, and it kind of talked about um, media players and uh, the underlying, uh, you know, operating system um, applications that are running in conjunction with those media players. Um, but it didn't necessarily refer to like what kind of processing um, media players are playing certain files would be would be pulling. Um, this is definitely an interesting topic. Um, I would love to be able to do a little bit more research and seeing if there's a paper out there. Uh, and if not, one should definitely be uh, written. Great. Um, Reto actually um, had a, a comment about scope. And uh, in some scanners, you can mount scope lenses, um, but it's definitely much easier in post, as we talked about. Um, I. I think we may have tackled all of the questions that have um, arisen in the chat box. If I missed it, that's my fault. I'm going to comb back through, but please um, feel free. We have um, we still have about 10 minutes together, and we'd love to um, make use of um, Eric's expertise on the line today and uh, either hear more about your current workflows um, uh, or specific questions. Um, working with vendors as well. I know that um, Internet Archive has an operation underway. Demetrius wrote that they are um, shooting to be able uh, to scan films at 60 frames per second with total work time at 80% of duration, including calibration and QC mentioned. That's great. Um, That's um, a really good number. Uh, so kudos to them. Yeah. And uh, I know that there have been a lot of questions about setting up in-house scanning for film. Um, but understandably, you know, it's cost prohibitive for many institutions. So working with vendors tends to be um, the primary way in which institutions um, uh, at this point are scanning film. But that's not to say it won't evolve and, and change in the coming years, and specifically as, as the cost of equipment may decrease over time. So I had another question for you, Eric. Um, in thinking about different types of film soundtracks, um, can you talk to us a little bit about um, different digitization options for various film soundtracks, and you talked a little bit about optical media, um, I'm sorry, optical soundtracks, but can you say more about that generally, about working with film soundtracks in this process? Um, yeah, sure. So, um, you know, for six, I'm, I primarily worked in 16 millimeter film scanning, and you have different types of um, optical uh, tracks there. I think the... Um, the main point is that for 16 millimeter, it's all monaural, um, and that it would, 
be scanned as a, as a single audio track. Um, whereas with 35, you can have either mono or stereo. Um, beyond 35, it gets a little bit um, more technical in that you have different kinds of um, noise reduction and, um, yeah, it's a whole different uh, level of scanning 35 uh, optical tracks. I'm sure Rito could probably um, give us good stories about what he's done um, in his lab. Um, but yeah, this kind of goes back to um, what I was saying earlier with like kind of understanding the characteristics of like the optical track and, and um, through using like these great sources like um, the Paul Reed and Mark, Mark Paul Meyer book. Great, and the, the question is probably on a number of uh, participants' minds if they haven't already begun scanning their film collection, um, is how can I pay for this work? What type of funding opportunities uh, are you aware of um, that participants on the line may wish to pursue? Um, I, I think, unfortunately, there are not too many um, Options there, um, there could be um, projects that that could be done through the NEA and the NEH. Um, there's uh, event, there's a thing, there's a funding related to the NFPF that could happen on for digital assets, but it's primarily focused on uh, photochemical preservation. Um, but yeah, there, there, there is funding for large-scale film digitization projects in certain areas, um, like the NEA in in the United States. Um, right, I can't I can't speak for European funding. Um, maybe someone on the list could 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 speak on that. Yeah, and additionally, if I'm not mistaken, um, the National Film Preservation Foundation their grants. Um, one of the components, the requirements, of course, is is um, producing a new print, but one could ostensibly do film out from a scanning project. Um, you may have to dig in um, to the fine print a little bit more closely, but um, I believe uh, that as long as you're producing a print as one of the pieces, that you could you could do film out from from a digital workflow. Um, so. If you have other ideas for funding, other pockets of funding that you know of, um, you can let us know. Or if you have used NFPF funds um, uh, to not just do photochemical work, but to do uh, scanning and digitization, then we'd be eager to hear, just to clarify. Um, I see one other question, going back to sound tracks a little bit, um, in thinking about um, mag tracks versus optical tracks, um, the different approaches. Um, well, you obviously have mag stripe that could be found um, on 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 16. Um, you also have full coat uh, mag tracks, and those um, you know require different um, playback heads. Um, so you could necessarily put a full coat mag um, on a film scanner if it didn't have the proper uh, reader. Um, so. There are scanners that are able to scan um, mag stripe uh, on, you know, composite uh, film prints, but um, full coat mag audio is something that's a little bit different that would require um, a certain kind of reader. Great. Um, I want to let folks know on the line um, that we do have one more uh, webinar in this series that will be coming up on Tuesday, October 20th. The information is there on the screen. If you joined us for the first session, um, Barry Lunt, the professor from uh, Brigham Un Young University, BYU, um, will be joining us again on Tuesday to talk about digital storage and infrastructure. And that will be the cap to our EMEA webinars. Um, Tuesday the 20th. Um, if you have any additional questions, we do have a couple minutes remaining here. 
And um, and then I also have for you all uh, the email address for Eric as well as um, how to find him on Twitter as well. Um, and I should note that the Association of Moving Image Archivists uh, uh, allowed the online continuing education series to take place this fall. They gave it the green light. Um, it was a project of the Education Committee at EMEA, um, which is chaired by Linda Tadek and Lance Watsky. So uh, for the last year or so, there have been um, a group of uh, individuals who've come together to develop the curriculum uh, for both uh, this series as well as another series on personal and small audiovisual archives, personal archives and small AV archives. So um, all of that information has been recorded, like this session is being recorded today. So if you uh, registered for this session, you'll be able to access um, this recording in the future to review it. Um, we also have the materials for today's session in the materials tab. And just to remind you, there are two PDFs. One's a resources handout that has a lot of really helpful links to um, publications and associations um, and a lot of great info um, in, in that uh, resources PDF that uh, Eric uh, compiled. And then there's also a PDF of today's presentation. So um, we're delighted that you all have joined us today for um, this seventh session of the EMEA Online Continuing Education Series. Thank you so much, Eric Peel, for joining us. Um, thank you, Eric. Oh, and yep. time, time for a question. Jordan, you're getting in just an, under, the, under the wire. Of course we have. Oh, no. <laughs> just joking. Um, Okay, so if you do have questions, we would love to hear from you. Your comments um, and evaluations of these sessions have been really helpful, and uh, we've really been listening to your feedback. So please continue to send along your uh, feedback on the sessions that you've attended, but also let us know what you'd like to see in the future. We have no additional webinars scheduled at this point, but um, you know it would be really helpful uh, for your guidance to help us think about um, what might be topics and arenas in which we should consider for the future. So, Eric, thank you again for joining us today. No problem. Okay, and at this point, I am going to officially sign off and uh, look forward to seeing many of you again next week for the session on Tuesday. Take care. Bye-bye.